Bitcoin, blockchain, ICOs, Ethereum, and all the rest. Are cryptocurrencies the 21st century unicorn, a speculative bubble, or the future of money? The CryptoCast will help you understand the rise, the fall of digital currency, the highs, the highlights, the potential, and the lows, the scams, and pitfalls. I'm your host, Jason Hartman, and we'll talk with some of the biggest names in the space. CryptoCast is your resource for all things crypto. Let's go. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Nima Sanandaji, uh, president of the European Center for Entrepreneurship and Policy Reform, author of a few books, including the new one, The Birthplace of Capitalism, The Middle East. Previously, we talked about uh, one of the uh, prior books, Debunking Utopia, Exposing the Myth of Nordic Socialism. Also uh, a book prior to that, Scandinavian Unexceptionalism, Culture, Markets, and the Failure of Third-Way Socialism. So check all of these books out. They're, they're really quite fascinating. Welcome back, Doctor. How are you? Thank you. Thank you. I'm very good. It's good to have you Excited back on the show. Excited to be on the show. Yeah, thank you. A lot of people think of capitalism as kind of a European thing, starting in the markets of maybe Rome or something like that. But tell us about the Middle East. Uh, I don't know if you're going to talk about Egypt or, or what when you talk about the Middle East being the birthplace of capitalism. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I will talk about Egypt because Often, when people talk about free markets, and especially the people who are supporters of free markets, they often believe that capitalism is a new invention. And it's often traced back to the Industrial Revolution, or some people say, no, no, we go a little bit before that, the Dutch Merchant Republic, or some people say, no, no, capitalism was born, and this is more correct, in the Renaissance cities of Northern Italy. But this is the modern capitalism. And I say that saying that capitalism comes from Industrial Revolution or even Renaissance Italy is like saying that the iPhone is the first mobile phone because the iPhone inspired all the modern phones, right? Mm -hmm. It's a superior modern phone, just inspired all other smartphones. But there were many, many, many phones before the iPhone. Sure. And this is the same thing with um, free markets, with capitalism. The first model of uh, enterprise, the first market economy, the first early banks in the world actually begin in the countries we now know as Iraq and Syria. So uh, it is in these countries, and more specifically, the Babylonian civilization and the Assyrian civilization, that 4,000 years ago, we had the first enterprises, the first free markets. Mm -hmm. And I begin writing about that in the book. And really, I think this story is fascinating because Archaeologists, you know, they've dug up many, many clay tablets and they've translated them. And these clay tablets, 4,000 year old, you know what they are? You know what it says on them? What? They are receipts. They're receipts ah, of economic okay, transactions. Okay. All right. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, that's why people largely invented writing mm-hmm. to record transactions. And from these transactions, we know that these guys, they invented pretty market-based model. And everything really supports this. The first uh, codes of law that exist coming from these ancient, ancient civilizations, they were about protecting private property viciously. They were about protecting the right of contract. And during this golden age of humanity that we have in Babylonia, in Assyria, all this technology, all this wealth, it was market driven. And it's just fantastic how much development that these market-driven civilizations had. Yeah, yeah. And you said something. You said Egypt. Well, I recently wrote an essay about the pyramids of Egypt. And these are the pyramids of Egypt are seen as the true wonders of the world. I said they are the best examples of government waste in the history of humanity. Because the ancient Egyptians, alongside the Mesopotamians, were the first civilization on the planet. The Egypt was more of a centrally planned economy. So the government directed the resources of Egypt into building the pyramids essentially building mountains, man-made mountains, to please the central government. Whereas in the Middle East, they had much more free market model. They had a much more private ownership model, private manufacturing model. So what they did was they just invented many, many of the technologies, many of the goods, many of the early manufacturers that propelled human uh, civilization further. Mm -hmm. And this is really something I find in my book that the golden ages of human civilization in, in Mesopotamia, in China, in India, 
were very much driven by early forms of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Give us a sense of your worldview, if you would. Uh, where are you located? You live in Scandinavian country somewhere, right? Are you Sweden in Sweden? Or? I am uh, born in Iran, Kurdish Iranian. I lived most of my life in Sweden. I mm -hmm. write still a lot of books for the Swedish political debate. But I've moved myself to Malta. Okay, good. So I find it really interesting, uh, your writings and thoughts about the Scandinavian countries and this sort of myth that uh, they're so successful with socialism. And I, I'm really glad you're you're raising that issue because it is a big misunderstanding I, I, in the world today, I believe. Uh, so I, I want to make sure you get a little time to just comment on that and comment on your other two books, if you would. But take us deeper into this subject of uh, Middle Eastern capitalism. Also, by the way, give us a sense of, of time. What year are we talking about? Ancient Egypt? Are we, do we go back as far as 5,000 years or what? Well, that's a very good point. So if we talk about the birthplace of enterprise, the first enterprises, banks, the first market economy, this develops 4,000 years ago mm -hmm. in like Iraq and Syria. And then the Middle East for much of this 4,000 years has a very market-driven economy. For example, in the time of the Roman Empire, you would always see that the eastern provinces like Syria and Turkey were much wealthier than the European provinces. Uh -huh. And the reason is they were more of uh, market economies. They had more of uh, private ownership, factories, early factories, producing goods for foreign uh, markets. And the interesting thing is that the concept of enterprise, the concept of banking, it comes to Europe, it comes to Mycenic uh, and then to Greeks. But the Greeks and the Romans never embrace it. So in, the, in Greece and Rome, the people who would own a business, the people who would own a bank, the people who would be captains of merchant ships, they were often slaves. And these slaves could buy themselves uh, free and become rich people. Or they were Syrians or Jewish people. That is people from the Middle East. Because European culture for many, many hundreds of years didn't really buy into market exchange being a good thing. So Plato, for example, the view that Plato had on entrepreneurship is so hostile that even Karl Marx, I think, would be surprised. <laughs> wow, yeah. Interesting. Karl Marx, uh, sadly, uh, one of the most influential economists in all of history, maybe the most, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> isn't that terrible that the worst idea became the biggest idea, <laughs> you know? It's kind of like uh, back to the days of videotape, VHS versus Betamax, right? The Betamax was the better standard. You know, many people would argue that Apple was the better operating system than Windows and DOS, but uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it's strange how the best things don't necessarily become the most popular, do they? Yeah, I'd like to make a comment, and I briefly write about this in my book. The first socialist revolution in the world is also in the Middle East. Did you know that? No, tell us about that. And, and what year? Give us a uh, context time-wise, too. This happened in Iran. So the ancient Iranians had a religion called Zoroastrianism. And Zoroastrianism is kind of a religion similar to Christianity and Islam. It's about the struggle of good and evil. It's very related to these religions. But Zoroastrianism is a very much more uh, free market religion. So the Zoroastrian faith actually specifically says if you're an honest person and you don't lie, if you make money, not only is it okay, it's a good thing. And the ancient Persians were very free market oriented. I write that the Persian king Cyrus the Great, you know, who freed the Jews from slavery in Babylon, who founded the first uh, big world empire, is also the first known proponent of free markets. Mm -hmm. But then Persians, somewhere around 1,500 years ago, we have a priest of this Western faith who kind of clashes with these free market ideas. And his, his name is Mazdak. And Mazdak was essentially a Middle Eastern, much early version of Karl Marx. And he carried out a socialist revolution. And this, this revolutionary socialist movement actually would um, migrate in Asia and it would spread even to the Chinese and the Mughals. And why is this relevant? Well, I think it's relevant because it just shows you that not, I mean, many of these ideas, yeah, free markets, capitalism, voluntary exchange, and also socialism have a deeper historic root than we believe. And if you kind of analyze them, you see that um, 
they influence society much more. Mm-hmm. One of the things I write about my book is, is this contrast with the pyramids and the underground irrigation systems of the Middle East. Mm-hmm. Because I believe that the true wonder of the world is actually something that almost no European or American know about. What is that? Well, it's underground irrigation systems. So around 3,000 years ago in Iran, they invented uh, uh, canards. Canards are underwater channels which run maybe 100 meters underground, and they run for many kilometers typically, and they take water from underground to the deserts, and they make the deserts fertile. 100 meters under the ground? That's, you know, 400 feet? I mean, that's very deep. Yeah. Imagine if you were to construct, uh, I told you, with modern technology, I want to find underground water. You have to find it first. Mm -hmm. Then you have to build a canal that takes this underground water several kilometers, 100 meters underground. And you also need to dig a bunch of wells all along the system because otherwise, you know, your workers will suffocate. You need the wells to maintain this channel. And additionally, it has to have an exact angle. Mm -hmm. If it's just too steep or then it won't work. It would be a difficult project, wouldn't it? Oh, I can imagine. Sounds very difficult. I mean, everybody is in the major praise of the Romans and what they did with the aqueducts, but uh, this is more difficult than that. Those were above ground. Yeah, and they actually didn't build a few of these. They built tens of thousands of these underground channels. And these channels are the reason why countries like Iran and Syria, I mean, throughout history, have been very important places of civilization. Mm -hmm. A lot of people lived there. They were important because they dug out these underground channels. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people think that infrastructure must be built by the state, but Mm -hmm. these underground channels, which are perhaps the most impressive infrastructure in human history, and they actually watered the Middle East until just a few decades ago. The majority of the water supply came from these channels. These were built by market forces. Mm -hmm. The government didn't do anything. They were paid by farming collectives Mm -hmm. because private property was very strong. And the farmers knew that if they could irrigate a a part of the desert, they would have ownership of that desert Mm -hmm. and that water and their children would inherit it. So they would invest. They would say, you know, take half of our harvest for 10 years time and dig this channel for us. And then a group of private contractors would actually carry out this massive project. And Mm -hmm. this would repeat thousands and thousands of times throughout the ancient Middle East. Wow. Wow. That's really incredible. What is the connection with capitalism on that? Or did you make it? I'm sorry if I missed it, but certainly you could do massive public works projects uh, with, you know, enslaving people to the government or the king or the pharaoh. Yeah. You don't need capitalism for that necessarily. <laughs> but it... No, but and what you get then is the pyramids of Egypt. The pyramids mm-hmm. of Egypt, which are these massive structures, which are uh, built by taxation and slavery. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're so impressive that people say people couldn't have built them. They must have been aliens or whatever. No, mm-hmm. they built them with their technology mm-hmm. and they're worthless because it was state dictate. The canards, the underwater channels, were not built by state dictate. Mm-hmm. They were built by private contractors and they were financed by farmers. Mm-hmm. And the only reason that the finance was possible was very strong private property rights Mm -hmm. and limited, by the way, taxation because the farmers knew that they would keep what they were producing on on that soil. Mm -hmm. And and they would use many years future revenue to pay for the ganats. So it Mm -hmm. was a private property based model that financed it. And the work was done by private contractors. The only role the state had was to maintain private ownership. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, interesting. Very interesting. It sounds almost Ayn Randian, you know, with a limited yeah. government and, and so forth. Yeah, very good. Very interesting. What else do you want us to know? Maybe a question I haven't asked you or uh, just any, any thoughts? Well, I, I mean that uh, many people are interested in the role of capitalism through history because they want to say, listen, capitalism is a good system. Free markets work. And they usually buy into this European Western narrative which says, all right, uh, no, capitalism is something that came a few hundred years ago. Mm-hmm. But if that is, this has always annoyed me, if this is true, then it means all the massive technological development, all the massive increase in, in you know, better goods, better services that has happened throughout history has been driven by something else than capitalism. Mm-hmm. And that's why I wrote this book largely, 
Because let's take hospitals. Who invented modern hospitals? Well, they were invented in India, China, very much in the Middle East during this golden age of Islam. And they were, to a very large extent, uh, private institutions. Mm -hmm. Progress of humanity through history has been very market driven. Mm -hmm. And another thing, I think, is the ideology of free markets. So, for example, I cite uh, a story about a great Persian king, Cyrus the Great, who's, you know, he's known for having written the early declaration of human rights. If you go to the UN uh, building, you find a Cyrus scrolls when Cyrus 2,500 years ago had ideas about human rights. What people don't write about is Cyrus the Great was a strong believer in free markets. And he essentially believed that a government had no role in determining what is efficient exchange on marketplace. Mm -hmm. The only role of the government was to maintain private property and voluntary contracts. Yeah, like Ayn Rand would say, just maintain a yeah. court system and maintain rule of law and leave everything else to the free market. Interesting, very interesting. And if you uh, fast forward uh, to the, um, you know, this age of uh, Islam, so like this is a bit less than a thousand years ago, again, the uh, Middle East has a free market renaissance, which actually starts before Islam comes, but then continues under Islam. And it's very interesting. I cite what these intellectuals were writing because when free markets comes as a renaissance, like a thousand years ago in the Middle East, there has to be an intellectual tradition to defend it. When countries move towards capitalism, they have to have intellectuals that defend the model. And it's fascinating because the ideology of free markets that you find in the Middle East like a thousand years ago in the age of Islam is so radical if you would have it today. For example, they said the public sector can do works, like the public sector can build a road, but only if it benefits everybody. If only a certain group benefits from a project, automatically they should pay for it. Right, right. Well, that's what we've got in the United States and probably everywhere where you have big government. We've got the government's been hijacked by special interest. And, yeah. you know, there's that famous quote, and I can't remember the quote or who said it, but it's basically the concept is when the electorate can control doling out benefits to themselves from the public treasury, you know, the end is near, essentially, that's the yeah. concept. And, and here we are, right? We've got these certain groups who can vote themselves the perks in the US. We have these public employee unions. It's a disaster. I don't know how you ever recover from this. You know, once these these golden triangles become entrenched, or iron triangles, as they call, as they call them, mm. not golden triangles, you can't dislodge them anymore. It's just mind boggling, really is. Exactly. And let me take two examples, one from India, one from China. So in China, we have Confucianism. And the ideas of Confucius, this philosophical tradition, are still very strong in China. I mean, they're not very religious people. Instead, they believe in this philosophical tradition of Confucius. Now, what is valuable to know is, first of all, Confucius was a big opponent of heavy taxation. He did not believe in taxation. But more importantly, the second most important uh, Confucian philosopher is Mencius, who mm -hmm. comes like 100 years after Confucius. And this guy, his ideas are basically like Reaganized economics. He's a libertarian conservative. He believes that taxes should be low. The government should not intervene in the economy. The government should not intervene in the freedom of contract. There shouldn't be monopolies. You shouldn't tax the marketplace. It's not a good thing to tax the marketplace very sophisticated and very free market ideology in one of the most important philosophical traditions even today. And then you have uh, Taoism, again, a Chinese philosophical tradition. The founder of Taoism, Lao Zi, is really without doubt the first known libertarian. Mm -hmm. And he would teach the ancient Chinese as many hairs as the oxen has on his body, as many laws does the government has to plague our lives. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you can be afraid of a ferocious tiger, but you should be more afraid of the power of central government. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you re it really goes deep. And the ideas, they're much more sophisticated than you would think. In India, India also develops free markets on its own. In India, there's a story of the rat merchant. And the story, if I just tell it very quickly, is there's a farmer boy who is the poorest farmer boy you can imagine. And his dad tells him, I have nothing on my farm. Mm -hmm. Go to the city. We have nothing. So he has zero possessions. He has zero skills. He's a young boy. He's starving. He goes to the city. 
And he, he overhears the Ministry of Finance. The Ministry of Finance tells his friend, you know, if you're a good capitalist, you can take anything and become wealthy if you understand the marketplace. I tell you, you could start with only a dead rat as a position. Mm -hmm. So this boy listens to this. He picks up a dead rat. He goes around the city. And everybody laughs at him. Look at that super poor child with a rat. But then he finds a merchant whose cat wants to eat the rat. The merchant says, I'll give you a coin for the rat. Mm -hmm. So he makes an exchange. He doesn't buy food. He buys a beacon of uh, like something to have water in. He goes and fills it with fresh water. And he thinks, where can I sell fresh water? Okay, I go to the fields where they're picking flowers when it's really hot. He sells the water. They mm -hmm. say, you want money? He says, no, give me flowers. He thinks, where do they want flowers? Okay, if I go to that part of the city, the young ladies will want flowers. So he continues to analyze the marketplace, buys and sells, invests his money, and he makes other people happy. And ultimately, he's a super wealthy merchant. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine this is the American dream. This is the Indian dream, the ancient Indian dream of accumulating wealth on the marketplace. And if you read these stories, I reread the stories of the Thousand and One Nights. You, you know the Thousand and One Nights? Mm, vaguely. I can't remember it very well, but certainly I, you know, I, I remember hearing of it. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's important because Thousand and One Nights is a collection of the stories of the Arabs, the Iranians, and the Indians. It's a story collection, like roughly a thousand years old, which collects the classical stories of this part of the world. And here's the thing. Here's a kicker. The capitalists are often the heroes of these stories. Capitalists are the heroes of the stories on Thousand One Night. Whereas capitalists, people who are looking for making profit, people whose goal is to make money, are very, very, very seldom the heroes of Western fiction. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at the Hollywood movie. Oh, yeah, the not at all. The yeah. capitalist is a villain. Yeah, of course. I mean, we, we all know that. It's just terrible the way that is uh, portrayed. You know, the big evil capitalist, the greedy scumbag, you know, that's always the way it is. But that's the way it is. You know, what, what can I? Well, you, know? you could learn from the East. Really, yes. here, I think the Western world could learn from the, not the current Middle East, of course, but from the golden ages of development in the Middle East, in mm -hmm. India and China. Right. Because those were periods with market economy. And one difference is that culturally, I would argue that the Middle East, India, and China, culturally, they're still more commercial than Western culture. Mm -hmm. Culturally, European culture centrally is anti-market. Mm -hmm. Americans are a bit more pro-market, but look at Hollywood. Mm -hmm. So this kind of uh, friction between culture and free markets and wealth creation actually still, I would argue, exists more in the Western world than it does in places like Arab world or Persia or India. Yeah, it's very very interesting view. I I think most people probably haven't considered that much. So I'm I'm glad you raised it uh, and and talked to us about that. I would certainly say the U.S. is more capitalistic than modern Europe. There's no question about that. But yeah. both of them have just been diluted down like crazy. And it, it's so interesting when you look at history. You know, capitalism is just such a natural thing. Yeah, it is like people just. They don't have to be taught capitalism. They just do it automatically. Even where you have these messed up, overreaching uh, governments, people are still capitalistic. Even in former Soviet Russia, I remember, you know, when I was in uh, Romania, my tour guide, who was sort of uh, high up in the Russian media, worked for, you know, the equivalent of the TASS news agency, I guess, whatever it was in Romania. Maybe it was TASS there. I'm not sure. But, you know, she would talk about how you'd wait in line for two days to get shoes, when the shoes would be allocated, and then everybody would just trade them on the gray or the black market to get their size right. You know, they, they just always capitalism it, it was it was the natural thing isn't that amazing yeah i would however say one thing it's one thing to have voluntary trade but capitalism as i see it is a pretty complex infrastructure yeah, around enough. this voluntary trade fair enough fair enough and this is what we find in uh, babylonia assyria I, I mean they were much more sophisticated than today it's funny you said shoes because you know adam smith Everybody think Adam Smith is a founding father of economics mm -hmm. because he described how a free market works and he described voluntary exchange on a private market, the invisible hand of the market, mm -hmm. right? In my book, I show, first of all, the invisible hand of the market had been described in China in the Middle East thousands of years before Adam Smith. And this is fascinating. Adam Smith, it turns out, 
when he was giving his university lectures, he used to refer to Xenophon, who wrote about the marketplace of ancient Persia 2,000 years before Adam Smith. Mm-hmm. And in his book, he basically plagiarized it because he stopped referring to Xenophon. Mm-hmm. But the account that Adam Smith gave on how the free market works was actually about Persia, like 2,500 years from our time. And it was about shoemakers. Mm-hmm. He described the market for shoemakers to describe, you know, how competition and market specialization works. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And these concepts, as you say, they are much, much older than we know and they created much, much more astonishing development that people today know. Let me just lastly give you the example of the swords that were used in the Crusades. Mm-hmm. In the Crusades, the Muslims always had the strongest metal, right? Mm-hmm. And for hundreds of years, the Europeans tried to duplicate their metals because they had much stronger swords. Mm-hmm. Recently, scientists discovered, recently, just a few decades ago, few years ago, actually, why the swords of the Muslims were so strong. You know why? Why is that? They had put carbon nanotubes in the swords. They had used... Carbon nanotubes? I mean, that's something we thought was uh, some great new invention, nanotubes. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. yeah. Their industry, uh, private industry for creating metals, was obviously so advanced that they had by chance discovered how to put carbon nanotubes in the steel and this is one of the things which fascinates me if you read history people had much more technology and much more progress in the past and those who had it were the people who were living in economic free societies Mm -hmm. so my view of capitalism is historically we have had islands of capitalism coming creating massive technology massive wealth and then uh, somebody some violent guy like the mongols come attack, kill everybody, and capitalism needs a certain level of peace and stability. Mm -hmm. So really, the story of humanity is how to have a framework of voluntary exchange and private ownership. And once this framework creates massive wealth and technological advancement, how not to have an aggressive state or have an aggressive neighboring tribe Mm -hmm. invade you and rob you and kill you and dominate you. Mm-hmm. This is really the struggle of humanity. Right. Very, very interesting. Yeah. You know, it's uh you become valuable, you become successful, and then uh everybody's trying to get at you, you know. <laughs> I mean it's the history of the world. But back to my comment on capitalism, I just wanted to say one more thing that I think is interesting. And I would I would call capitalism the most successful and we'll do this in single quotes, religion the world has ever known. (laughs) You know, it's like we were talking about just how natural it is. Very interesting history. Very interesting history. Before you wrap it up, do you want to say anything about the uh, Scandinavian Nordic uh, books and, and, you know, debunking utopia and so forth? I I love, I love that you've addressed that subject because it, it seems that nobody else has. Well, well, I mean, uh, these books are actually there are three books, uh, Scandinavian Unexceptionalism, Debunking Utopia and the Nordic Gender Equality Paradox. Mm -hmm. And these books have their life of their own. Uh, I think they're 500, 600 times they've been quoted internationally in big publications around the world, really. Mm -hmm. China, Europe, South America, Canada. And so my core idea is Nordic socialism never has worked. Instead, the Nordic countries are successful because they have an astonishing culture of individual responsibility and also because... They've had a long history of small government and free markets. Mm -hmm. And even today, in many regards, they're more free market oriented than the United States. Mm -hmm. And what is very sad about the Nordics is that they had this astonishing Protestant working ethics, which is just mind blowing. And then the socialists come, said, listen, guys, you have such a strong working ethics. We'll have a welfare state because everybody will work, right? Nobody will take overuse government benefits. <laughs> Nobody will stop working if taxes yeah, are high. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, and go it ahead. worked short time because, right. as I show in the research, yeah, if I raise the taxes, you might not stop working because you're a hardworking guy, but your children will be affected right. because parents tell their children, you know, to adapt. Mm-hmm. And the Swedish parents, you can see it, they tell their children all the time, oh, be whatever you like. Who cares? Mm-hmm. Right. Follow right. your heart. 
mm-hmm. and they've destroyed their own culture of hard work. Mm-hmm. And also, in my theory, their system isn't really that good. They themselves have strong culture. So what happens when countries like Sweden has had immigration? Well, the immigrants don't have this crazy Protestant working uh, responsibility ethics. They have normal ethics. Mm-hmm. They come to these countries, they're trapped in welfare dependency, and they're trapped in poverty. Mm-hmm. And then you get a, a lot of cultural problems. Look at Sweden. Sweden, the peaceful country, has many, 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 many neighborhoods with violence, with crime, with, oh, you know, Especially shootings. post-immigration. Uh, oh, I mean, it wasn't before oh. the immigration, right? No, no, no. Yeah. All, all of them are, um, are neighborhoods with many immigrants, right. every mm-hmm. one of them. Yeah. And a large explanation for this is actually the welfare state system. It just shows it doesn't work that well. You're trapping so many people in welfare dependency, so more people are socially poor than would otherwise be the case. And also this soft liberal approach, this soft progressive approach they have doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It doesn't solve crime. It doesn't uh, solve social problems. So you really see that Nordic socialism, Nordic welfare states are a myth. Mm -hmm. The only thing these people are showing is that Nordic people have a strong Protestant culture. And in my books, I, you know, show this that, you know, the people who left the Nordics as poor immigrants and came to America, their descendants are much, much wealthier in terms of income than the people of Nordics. And they have either the same or much better uh, outcomes in terms of um, social outcomes. For example, Mm -hmm. Americans with a a Nordic background have much lower high school dropout rates than the people of the Nordic countries. Mm -hmm. So actually coupling American style capitalism with a Protestant culture is a much better choice than the Nordic way of adopting a big welfare state. And we're seeing this. We're seeing the system fail over time and with the influx of immigrants. One of my big works in Sweden now is I'm writing a number of uh, studies which just remind people the welfare state is not sustainable. There have been many, many big surveys, a research project essentially, and they all say, the welfare state is not sustainable. Mm-hmm. There have been like 12 big projects trying to look, is the welfare state sustainable? And they've been published between 2002 and 2018. Mm-hmm. None of them says, yeah, it's a sustainable system. Right. Even in the Nordic countries, yeah. the welfare state is just a system that is not sustainable over time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, what a surprise. <laughs> what a well, surprise. <laughs> right. It is a surprise to many yeah. because the left, have used the Nordic countries as their model for so long. I think I've made a dent in their claims. Mm -hmm. I've seen that fewer people use it now. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, they don't have facts. They just seem to have facts. It's like, yeah, you know, John is a tall guy and he eats carrots. Mm -hmm. That's their level of sophistication in their arguments. Just a correlation, no causation. They don't have any causation. Well, I don't think the left believe their own arguments. I think they just believe that they want power and control. And that's what they believe. And they're going to use whatever means, you know, the means justifies the ends, right, in their mind, to get there. You know, I I can't imagine any rational person seeing the results of what's happened in so many democratically controlled cities in the United States. And when I say democratically, I mean liberal controlled. They're a disaster in every way. The education is pathetic. The crime is a disaster. The people are oppressed through welfare. It's a mess. You know, there's no evidence that any of this ever works at any place on earth or any time in history, yet they persist. (laughs) Let me just very quickly go back to my book, The Birthplace of Capitalism. So if you go back to the Middle East, not only did the Middle Easterners have capitalism, they also invented kind of like early welfare state. If you look at the Islamic Golden Age, they had a welfare state, but it was a small welfare state. and, And they understood very well that once the state becomes big, it economy crashes. Mm-hmm. Now, you know Arthur Laffer, right? Yeah, oh, sure. I've met Arthur Laffer. I have a photo with him. Wow. Yeah. Me too, actually. Arthur Laffer himself says, I didn't invent the Laffer curve. Mm-hmm. It was invented by Ibn Khaldun, the North African Islamic scholar. Mm, interesting. And Ibn Khaldun's theory is fascinating. I write about it. You should read my book. He says, listen, some guy takes over government, a political group, and Once you have government, you start expanding government just to get more influence and money for yourself, Mm -hmm. right? Yep. Self-interest. And more and more groups come 
and sit by the government people just to get money. So the crowd who is like the special interests around the government become more and more and they're hungrier and hungrier. Now, the government has to get more money. Somehow it has to tax the people to feed all of the people living off government. And so taxes increase. And Ibn Khaldun says, ultimately, every time people and merchants and, you know, will say, wait a minute, this is not fair. They're going to leave the country. They're going to hide their incomes. They're going to start working less. And Ibn Khaldun doesn't say that revenues shrink only. He says revenues shrink, but government becomes a bloated organization which cannot slim down. Governments, he observed, can't just slim down. Once they bloat, they collapse under their own weight. Oh, yeah, so of course. This is, yeah. they so can't, this and is they, the, they, the reason they can't slim is because the iron triangles right? Yeah. That's the reason they can't slim is because everybody becomes self-interested and there's no slimming. There's only revolution or collapse, right? Yeah, yeah. And the best example of this through history is actually the China, because China had very sophisticated periods of free markets, very advanced free markets. I cite the old Chinese texts, which are like 2,000, 3,000 years old. It's like reading Forbes. They're describing the millionaires of China. It's like describing the billionaires of America today who are entrepreneurial capitalists. And they have the text about the invisible hand of the free market, which is just even better than Adam Smith. Now, China throughout its history has gone from less as fair free markets to state control that crushes the economy. And they've gone between these two extremes many times. And just recently, you know, they had communism, the Chinese were poorer than the Africans were. Mm -hmm. And then they got some kind of capitalism under the leadership of the Communist Party, but still capitalism. And they've seen the greatest reduction of poverty ever recorded in human history. Mm -hmm. So really think about one thing. Almost every invention you have, anything almost, gunpowder, medicines, either it originates in the Middle East or it originates in China, paper, you name it. And these countries... I mean, these civilizations for many thousands of years proved to us one thing. Free markets leads to development, to technology, to progress and to peace. Mm -hmm. If you move away from free markets, you have stagnation, massive poverty, and people are fighting with each other over the resources. So this is why the Middle East and China go between being very prosperous to being, you know, plagued by violence and chaos and poverty and Here's a thought for the Western world. Mm -hmm. The West has dominated the world once you invented Western capitalism, which is like iPhone. It's more superior to the earlier forms of capitalism because you have intellectual property rights, you have corporations, etc. Now, you have seen, I mean, the West has been in a free market period for the last, let's say, 500 years. But this isn't something given by God. If the Western countries like Northern Europe continue their current policies. I think China, India, many countries, perhaps some even the Middle East, will run past them in development because they're stuck in a big government high tax model. The Western world needs to learn from history and go back to the free market economic policies, such as those like Sweden had 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. Minimal government, minimal taxation. Right. Well, of course. So that, of course. Yeah. That gives prosperity. From a historic viewpoint, this is, I think, much more obvious once you have this like 4,000 year view of history. Mm -hmm. It becomes so much obvious. And really, I can't see any other good interpretation of history. Yeah, well, these are the kind of unassailable arguments that only an illogical leftist uh, with an ulterior motivation of uh, power control and their own greed could make an argument against because they just make sense. So thank you so much for coming back on the show today. It was good to have you on previously and sharing these ideas with our listeners. Give out your website, tell people where they can find your books and more information about your work. Yeah, so I have a new website just put up. Uh, it is called capitalism.global. Capitalism.global. Nima, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. 
Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own, and if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Thank you.